ladies and gentlemen, Mackenzie Lambert here with this installment of Vault of the Cult. We are in the month of October, which means one thing, Halloween. It's the most wonderful time of the year. For Halloween, I wanted to do a series that looks at the cream of the cult horror crop. I want to take a look at the best of the best horror movies. For our first entry in this series, I wanted to look at one that was clearly a product of its time. In October of 1974, one of the true horror classics was unleashed upon audiences. On this episode of Vault of the Cult, we'll be taking a look at the Toby Hooper gem, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Sally, I hear something. Stop! Stop! This is the movie Rex Reed called... The most horrifying motion picture I have ever seen. The Texas Chainsaw Massacre from New Line Cinema. The film opens with a scrolling intro. No. Anyway, this opening crawl sets the tone perfectly for the film. The film which you are about to see is an account of the tragedy which befell a group of five youths, in particular, Sally Hardesty and her invalid brother, Franklin. It is all the more tragic in that they were young. But had they lived very, very long lives, they could not have expected, nor would they have wished to see as much of the mad and macabre as they were to see that day. For them, an idyllic summer afternoon drive became a nightmare. The events of that day were to lead to the discovery of one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Thanks in no small part to the chilling reading by John Larroquette. <laughs> yes, that guy. A group of teens are on a road trip to their grandfather's grave after reports of desecration. Then they go to their grandparents' home. On the way, they take in a strange hitchhiker who quickly outwears his welcome. When they stop at a gas station, the old man attendant warns them not to go to their grandparents' house. Once there, they roam about the place. One by one, they wander off and come across a nearby house. They fall into the brutal clutches of the menacing Leatherface. When night falls, it is only Sally and Franklin, her invalid brother. They go into the woods looking for their friends. Suddenly, they are attacked by Leatherface. This leads to an extended chase, but just when she finds some respite, her night only gets worse from there. Texas Chainsaw Massacre is that type of horror movie that is topical on a subtle level. Roger Ebert addressed this in his review for the film. In his words, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre belongs in a select company of films that are really a lot better than the genre requires. The two films Ebert uses as comparisons? Night of the Living Dead and Last House on the Left. All three films do something special. They touch on the state of the world without directly addressing it. They present situations of chaos where the innocent are at the mercy of those who are without mercy. They commentate on the violence and horror within the world using villains and monsters that are essentially effigies for the ills of the world. Upon initial release, Texas Chainsaw Massacre received a mixed reception. In the negative camp, you had the Los Angeles Times and Harper's Magazine. In the positive praise camp, there was TV Guide, the Austin Chronicle, Empire, and Rex Reed. The film has been an admitted influence on horror figures like Stephen King, Wes Craven, Sam Raimi, and Peter Jackson. Here, Jackson talks about the impact the film had on him. I think it got banned actually in New Zealand, and it was before the time of video, and there was just no way to see Texas Chainsaw Massacre. But um, a company in England released it on Super 8. I remember being so affected by it that I, I watched it, and as soon as it was finished, I wound the reels back and I started it all over again. The degree of violence in the film has been the subject of debate. Stephen Koch and Ebert exclaimed the film was blood-soaked and sadistic, extreme in its violence. 
Yet, TV Guide and Leonard Wolf note the bloodless depiction of violence and even the lack of on-screen violence. I've seen the film a few times, and there is little to no bloodshed in the film. So, for what many consider to be one of the bloodiest movies ever made was actually not that bloody, thanks primarily to the lighting and the cinematography. The film manages to maintain a near-constant sense of tension and unease. From the encounter with the hitchhiker in the beginning, right to the very end of the film, the audience is subject to set-piece after set-piece that will affect them. Not helping is the lack of a music score. That absence of music makes it difficult for the audience to anticipate what's going to happen next. The film relies on ambiance and natural sounds, then hits the audience with a sound or a quick shot. The teens that are the victims are the most uninteresting characters I've seen in a horror movie. Well, some of the most uninteresting. The only standouts are Franklin and Sally. Franklin is an annoying twit. He's a whiny, self-centered man-brat. Sally doesn't stand out until she's the one left alive, and Marilyn Burns just goes full goose insane by the end of the film. The shots of her in the pickup truck is just unbridled lunacy. It is an amazing sequence. The real stars of the film are the members of the Sawyer family. Edwin Neal as the hitchhiker is the first member we meet. When he steps into the van, we immediately get the feeling that this guy has a few screws loose. To quote Stephen King, the elevator doesn't go all the way to the top floor. Jim Seedow plays the archetypal harbinger. He warns the kids to stay away from the house. Turns out he's also a member of the Sawyer family. For me, he's my favorite character. He's hilarious, he's got personality, he has my favorite line in the whole film. Look what your brother did to that dog! Now let's talk about Leatherface. Leatherface was one of horror's early masked slashers. People might remember him as being this brutish, hulking monster... But looking at the moments where he's on screen alone, there are some subtle moments where you see that Leatherface is thinking underneath his skin mask. After Jerry is killed, look at the moment when Leatherface sits down. The camera zooms in on Leatherface's, well, Leatherface's face. There you can see his eyes are looking about. There's almost as if gears are turning inside his head. He's probably thinking where these people are coming from. And are there more of them? You see Gunnar Henson actually act under the skin mask. And then there is the dinner scene. In this scene, Leatherface is all dressed up. He has a skin that resembles a porcelain doll complete with makeup. For a brute, Leatherface is uncharacteristically conscientious about his appearance. Who would think that a backwoods cannibal would have the thought to carry themselves in such a manner? Leatherface is a character that has a lot going on than some audiences might realize. To wrap up this review, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is a horror work that excels in tension and allowing the audience to let their imagination run wild with the violence. There is a quality to this film that seems lost in allowing the viewers to fill in the blanks for the gore, as well as tackling the state of human civilization in the early 1970s. Seldom do movies have such a memorable bunch of horror villains, with Leatherface being the mascot in the making for this series. This is truly one of the greatest horror movies ever made. And thanks for watching this look at Texas Chainsaw Massacre. What are your thoughts on the film? Feel free to share them in the comments. Uh, feel free to follow my channel for future content. Uh, you can find me on Twitter and Facebook. You can also hit me up on Gmail. I'm Mackenzie Lambert with The Vault of the Cult. Until next time, take care everyone.